Okay, everybody. Well, welcome. It is how to systematize your job search. We are. Ho I hope you are doing well on this Tuesday afternoon, wherever you are located around the world. It is February 6th, 2023. All right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to systematize your job search. Um, job searching is all about processes, and it can be an overwhelming process because it involves doing a lot of different things at once. And so we're going to talk about what that doing a lot of things at once actually means and how you can uh, figure, focus on a particular framework to help get you closer to where you want to be as you job search. I know many folks have been laid off or have experienced economic disruption over the last couple of months. And so I'm here to hopefully help you discover a process that can at least clear your mind because this can be such a daunting and, uh, and confusing process. So who am I? I know many of you have joined me here on this webinar before. For those of you who are here for the very first time, my name is Albert. Uh, I am the founder of Albert's List, a job search community of 49,000 members on Facebook uh, that supports uh, the presence of job seekers, hiring managers, recruiters, consultants, and other entrepreneurs. And so I encourage you all to join uh, Albert's List. It is a Facebook community. I know we have a lot of people waiting in queue right now, but please let me know you found me here and I will get you in. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash in slash Albert Chen, and you can find me there as well. Let me know that you found me over there. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about the state of the job hunt, because as I say in all of my webinars, it's important to know where we've been so that we can understand where we're going. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the frameworks that matter around understanding your job hunt. You're going to learn a whole new system that I think most of you probably have thought of the individual elements today, but probably have not understood all of the things individually speaking. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to give you guys some surprises that you can go home with because we all like a free gift at the end of the day. So to start off, we're going to talk about the state of the job hunt. Uh, for those of you who have been to my webinars in the last month, this should be of no new news to you um, as we talk about where everything is, right? So as you know, we're now in February. Uh, January was chock full of layoffs, and we've been doing layoffs for the past two years uh, as companies both go back to normal uh, from the pandemic time as companies realize they overhire, and as things like inflation start to uh, have hammered us for quite a while and have led to these increased number of layoffs. As you can see, we peaked in January 2023 when Facebook uh, and Google and many of these major tech companies laid off in swaths, many in, turn, in the case of Google and Facebook, for the very first time in their company history. And so, you know, this has been sort of a downward trend since then, but we're still continuing to see layoffs uh, here in January and early February as companies adjust themselves for the beginning of the new year and also make excuses like saying that uh, they are going, they are laying people off for macroeconomic concerns or for the more popular reason, uh, because uh, they are pivoting and transitioning to AI, which has been really hot for a while now. Uh, if you've also watched the job search situation, you also know that despite all of this craziness, whether you believe it or not, uh, unemployment has stayed low at 3.7% over the last couple of months and continues to remain low and continues to sit at all-time 50-year uh, lows despite all this disruption because other industries continue to be strong, notably healthcare, notably government, um, and things that don't necessarily lie in the tech field. And so what does that mean? We're also coming into a year where we're in another year of transition. Uh, this is just one of many predictions that you see on a regular basis around what exactly it is that the economy is being hit with and the future of work. Right, The future of work is a famous topic that we all love to talk about and hear, 
because it continues to be this issue of how work continues to change as folks want to be remote, as folks um, demand more salaries and so forth. And so the ones here that I want you to notice that are relevant to us today is, you know, the cost of work, uh, rising salaries and how that's changing as um uh, as uh, as workers become more expensive, but companies try to trim back. Uh, the emergence of AI, which is number two and number five here, and whether companies will actually cut employees because uh, AI has increased that level of efficiency. Uh, and then generative AI and so forth. And then as we look at more and more gen, or rather more and more baby boomers retiring, what we're going to see in terms of that replacement in the workforce. And so that's going to be a really interesting time in general. So as we look at where the market heads, I think the other thing that I also look at in terms of the future is when you see these large companies laying off and moving towards various areas, an area of push-pull that is always interesting to me is the startups that get funded. Uh, I know many of you here come from the startup world or were interested in this because of the startup bent. And so this is important to talk about because what startups and what venture capitalists invest in is oftentimes the flavor of the year, the flavor of the month in terms of what's important to people. And so I like to track on a quarterly basis the largest uh, funds that were, or rather the largest companies, or the rather the companies that received the largest rounds when it came to startups. And so what does that look like over the last quarter, right? This is, according to Career Builder Insights, the largest fundings that happened last quarter, which was October, November, and December. And so if you look at this, you'll notice that out of all of these companies that weren't your mobile telecom, internet, or consumer products, the largest fundings went to sustainability and generative AI. And so if you're looking for a new job, one of the things to always note is, what is it that investors care about? And you know, it's these emerging technologies and these technologies that are pertinent to what's going on out in our world right now. And so if you think about it, given the storms, especially if you're in California these last few days, uh, they've been really big. And so, you know, is it time to think about what our future looks like from that perspective or go all in on AI? Obviously, things like mobile and telecommunications continue to be hot because we try to continue iterating upon these technologies. And I think that those... Uh, and I think that those areas will continue to be important because mobile phones and all of these things and inter the internet have become ubiquitous to our ability to survive and live. And so 2024 as a whole is going to be a very interesting time. You know, as much as I think it's weird that, you know, we're not in a technical recession and our GDP uh, grew up, th grew 3.3% last quarter, there are a lot of people who have been out of work for a significant amount of time, especially in the tech field. And so while we aren't in a recession, these broad-based layoffs continue to bring about concern. Uh, the emergence of AI also requires thoughtful pivoting and resilience. And as you saw, I think, you know, AI continues to be this area of big funding. And we see in the comments or somebody who's asking, what about biotech? And I think that that's important too. I think that one thing to think about as we move into the new year also is that as we go on the heels of the pandemic, the search for new medicines, the search for cures, the search for being able to solve aging is always important and always big. And so when you think about that, I think biotech continues to be big as well. Uh, they did not crack the top 10 funding rounds, however, for Q4 2023. Uh, check back in a quarter when we do this, maybe in early April, whether that holds up and whether we get some new biotech rounds going on. How else will 2024 be interesting? So, you know, understanding the ongoing trends is always going to be key for your job search. You want to really be able to navigate your job hunt and navigate it effectively. And finally, the most important piece is no matter how well or how bad the economy is going, having the right framework at the end of the day helps you guide your next steps. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about. And then I'm going to go into the each of these pieces bit by bit because... Um, even though I know many of you are familiar with them, it also helps to maybe think of some of these in a different light as well. Um, 
Um, Nish asks a question. How do you see the biotech industry doing with respect to AI during the first two quarters in 2024? So I'm just looking at the data here for where the biggest fundings. Uh, somebody who looks at overall job search trends, I think one of the things I did see towards the end of last year was that there were a lot of biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies still hiring, especially in the South San Francisco area. I think that there's a lot of funding that goes into these places already. They may not be in the $500 million range, but they might as well, might, they are very well in the one to $300 million range, which is still very significant, but doesn't crack the top 10 of lists. So the next piece is we're going to talk a little bit about our job search. And, you know, the question that I always have asked myself over the years is, as I run my community of 49,000 people, it's always interesting to see who gets jobs and who does not. Um, and, you know, you can chalk it up to things like attitude. You can chalk it up things to like their life situation or their willingness to move and so forth. And, you know, I wondered why, why do some find jobs faster than others while others struggle? And how do we make sure that everyone has the equal same fighting chance? And, you know, the way, as I think as any maybe job search philosopher, I go to work and I think about what holds people back and why maybe some people go for job hunts that are six to nine months long and maybe go in an entire year without having a job. While there are other people who find jobs in three to six weeks or less. And, you know, one of the things that's always interesting to me, too, is what does it look like to uh, have a job search, even when a time like this, where maybe demand is uh, where demand for one particular position, such as recruiters, is low, but demand for, say, uh, finance and tax managers, as I've seen in my other communities, is really, really high. And so that's always an interesting one. And so the way I looked at it was I went to something that's always been familiar. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you who don't work in marketing or psychology or so forth, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a framework that's been used for quite a long time to describe what is necessary for human beings to feel safe in a particular environment where they feel like they can actually just be human, right? So if you look at this, Physiological needs must be met first in order for somebody to truly feel alive. They have to have hunger satiated. They have to feel like they're not thirsty. Uh, having a home is important. Uh, having a certain level of intimacy. Then you move up into being able to live in a safe environment where you can express yourself. And then moving all the way up to self-actualization where you feel like you are able to express yourself, but not only do that and be philosophical and be a deep thinker and have time to think is really, really important. If you're always down at the very bottom rung of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's what I also otherwise describe as being in constant survival mode. And so uh, I, I took the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I turned it into something new. And I called it the hiring hierarchy. The hiring hierarchy is what I describe as a framework that really covers what is needed in order for you to get hired right now. Uh, the hiring hierarchy talks about the priorities and the interests that companies uh, require out of their uh, out of their employees and out of their prospective candidates in order to really even show up for a role. And so, in a, in some ways, I'm thinking the way I thought is if you have the very bottom rung, which is you know hunger, your attitude, your hustle, self awareness, your ability to be resilient, and your ability to be committed, you can pretty much get any job you want right now. And this is just to mean that if you wanted to go and uh, um, if you wanted to go and uh, and get a job at McDonald's this afternoon, all you really need to do is show that you have the attitude and the resilience to handle customers and you can get that job right now. However, if you wanted to become a CEO of a large Fortune 500 company, you also need to have vision dynamics, uh, metrics to show that you've done well in the past, and a sense of leadership in order to lead a lot of different people. So today we're going to be covering a little bit of both in terms of the bottom rung and the top rung. 
What many of you might be thinking as you look at this previous diagram on this page is that there's a lot of elements in here that are understandably very, very intimidating. If you think about all of these things in their own separate little bits, it's a little bit easier, but you have to look at it in this framework because in some sense, it's a sense of prioritization of how you should view your job search. And so most of what happens on the first two rungs, which is your bottom to your bottom rung and the second to bottom rung is absolutely essential. You must have a good resume. You must have the attitude. You must have the self-awareness. You must be able to network and interview well in order to get yourself into most of um, most of the jobs that exist out there. On the other hand, having a sense of vision, having metrics to speak to, uh, having a connection or strategy between the job that you want and the way that you think through things, and having that leadership and credibility is not necessarily always important, but is always helpful, especially if you're going into that senior role. And so now that we've looked at this entire framework, I want to talk a little bit about each of these various different rungs and how they matter within your job search and how you can use each of them. As you know, we do separate webinars on each of these different topics. And so we're going to do a very five, five fifty thousand foot view, but you're still, I hope, going to walk away with valuable content that helps you tie everything together. So first, we're going to talk about getting on the ground floor, which is the very bottom of this rung. It consists of elements like hunger, attitude, hustle, self-awareness, resilience, and commitment. All of these things which are very important to succeeding in your job search because you need to be able to wake up in the morning and know that it is actually a job that you want and that you want to be effective in where you are. And so what does this look like? Right? Some of the things that I want to talk about are located in that very first rung. And I want to talk about resilience, right? Resilience is maybe the most important job search skill and really skill in general that I think any individual should have, uh, mostly because you're going to hear a lot of no's along the way. You have to be committed to your goal. If you get 1,500 no's and one yes, all you need is that one yes when it comes to getting a job. And you have to make that job hunting bit a habit. You have to learn to knock on doors, uh, make phone calls, send resumes, and know that you're going to get rejected along the way. Nobody goes one for one or 20 for 20 on job hunts unless they are somebody truly, truly exceptional. And, you know, unfortunately, I'll say they probably wouldn't end up in this webinar. And so resilience being the most important skill is what's going to keep you going from one rejection to another and being successful in that job hunt. It is, in my opinion, more important than being able to know how to code. It is being more important than uh, being able to do financial statements uh, and even being able to communicate because resilience is something that you live within yourself. Another one is having an attitude and growth mindset. So, you know what? I understand job hunting is something that exists out of most of our comfort zones. It's having that uh, it's having that belief that you are going to go and find what it is that you need as a part of your job search. Uh, one thing that I always say during my own job searches is what you're searching for is searching for you as well. And so when you're in that job search, it's important to know that you can only focus on what's within your locus of control. There's a million things going on out there. There are millions of people who are job hunting and being around the right people, having that level of accountability and having the right attitude makes all the difference. The final statement I want to make is that also having the right approach is important too. I know many of you and, you know, we were in this for a while, which was during the 2121 to early to mid 2022 phase, where it was all about the great resignation. You could go and leave your company and get lots and lots of jobs and somehow, um, somehow be, end up being ahead. But now that time has ended. And so you cannot take a great resignation mindset into a return to office world. And so you have to be more resilient, as I mentioned. You have to be flexible. You have to understand that what you may want may not all the way be there, but if you're willing to take a little bit of a pay cut, if you're knowing that you can be hybrid in the office or you know that you can take that contract just to be able to um, stand, out for a little, stand out for a little bit longer until the economy gets into a better place, then it can work out for you. And so what do you need to do to become this committed working professional at the end of the day? 
commitment, in my opinion, is table stakes. You have to know that you're going to wake up maybe for the next three to six months and you're going to be job hunting. You're going to be opening doors. You're going to be doing mock interviews. You're going to be calling up your friend and saying, hey, I'm here to get this job and I want the accountability and the people here to support me. And so you're not going to be waking up and saying, okay, I'll job hunt for three hours today. I'll job hunt for another 12 hours tomorrow, and then I'll take the next three days off. Momentum requires a lot of action and that bias towards action, which is a term you'll see in a lot of different job descriptions. It's what's going to help you stand out. And so getting in that combination of knowing how committed you are and putting yourself in that mindset practice where you're getting ready to do that job search and going all in is going to help you stand out um, when you go into that job market and experience the roller coaster ride that it has become. So that's going to be the first level of what it means to conduct your job search. And so how are you to do how how once you do that and once you've committed and once you've put yourself in the mindset, it's important to go to the next part, which is capturing the fundamentals and skills. And so this is a lot of the part that we've come to know as your resume, your personal branding, networking, uh, where you find those jobs that you look for, uh, having the right skills, and then being a really, really good interviewer. And so I'm actually going to talk about a little bit of each of these pieces today because I think it's important to cover all of these one by one. Uh, as you better understand uh, each of these in their own little mini frameworks. And so number one, the most important part of creating that job search is to create an inventory, an inventory of skills, an inventory of your interests, an inventory of your past experience of what it is that uh, you've done in the past so that you can get to the present and the future. And most people are just looking for a job just for the sake of looking for a job because they know that it'll bring them income, but it's a sense of purpose and it's a sense of uh, direction that really helps you focus down and meet the people that you want to meet. And so at the end of the day, I encourage everybody to form that inventory because it creates a sense of clarity. Uh, you're not going to be just going for any particular job uh, and, you know, end up, uh... oh, is my audio cut out? Let me see. I am not on mute. Okay, I'm back. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, basically in creating an inventory is the most important part of your job search because it creates the clarity that you need in order to stand out and show that you are somebody who knows what direction or purpose that you are taking in your life. And this is where the most of the job seekers struggle. So, if you're at the very beginning of your job hunt, I encourage you to come up with a list of companies that you want to work for. I encourage you to come up with a list of job titles that also are of interest to you as well. One of the things that I work on is an A through G list of what it is that I want to do for work. Um, point A would be being a product marketer. B would be a content marketer. C would be to work in social media. D would be to work at HR. E would be to run my own company. And, you know, F would be to maybe to go work in sales and, you know, so forth and so on. And so the more options you have, the more abundance it creates for the job search that you want to have. So what are the fundamentals of being able to do the job search that you have? Number one, it's... Uh, a variety of different things. So I'm not going to actually go through these as an enumerated list, but rather uh, things that are important to what it is that you have in your search. So your social media presence, got to clean that up. If you're somebody who likes to be political or somebody who likes to say controversial things, it's important to come out with that professional presence uh, for better or for worse. I know we just live in that unfortunate world. And so this is one of those moments where I just say it is what it is. Number two is to know your elevator pitch. So uh, who do you show up as? You know, my name is Albert and I'm a product marketer that helps you get your message out there so that you can dominate your market. My name is Albert and I help you simplify your job search so that you can find spend, spend more time talking to people and getting the job rather than struggling through your job search and so forth. And so I just kind of made that up as I went along and... It's important that you're able to do that and do that well. 
Uh, resume and cover letter is a very important piece. And so I have a resume workshop coming up in early March that all of you should attend that's on our Eventbrite page. A uh, resume and cover letter is incredibly key because it's the marketing document that helps you understand, helps your, um, your prospective employer understand what it is that you're all about. And so having a resume that can be seen within six seconds and have a clear objective statement is incredibly important because people only spend six to 10 seconds on a resume, if that at least, especially in this competitive world. And so the other piece for that that kind of goes on the opposite is even though you might have your resume, you also need to be well networked and also be in associations that serve your career and career interest. And so if you're a marketer, then maybe you're a part of Product Marketing Alliance. If you're an engineer, you have your respective organizations that you're a part of as well. And going into those to get the referrals, it's going to um, it's going to be incredibly important. And so, finally, number three and number four is knowing where you want and knowing where to go and find that. So we talked about having that inventory of your skills, that inventory of uh, companies that you want to work on, the closer you work and align yourself with that inventory, the more important it is. So when it comes to my day job as a product marketer, I'm looking to work in software as a service organizations focused uh, on anything that's related to cloud analytics, AI, uh, office-based applications, um, where I can create content, help bring products to market, launch those products and do meaningful uh, and do meaningful work that I can measure. And so the more that you become clear with that and the more that you articulate that well, the more recruiters are going to say, okay, I have a client who's doing that and direct you over that way. Yep. Um, so resume fundamentals, I know I just mentioned that, the six-second rule, focus on your highlights, be skill-driven and also be uh, results-driven. And so... Within that resume piece, it's important to not over not not oversell yourself with too many bullets, but be a person that a recruiter can see within six to ten seconds what it is that you've done, uh, and then see what it is that you've been able to create when you're there. And so, where we have a question here, where we say, like, what if you're a generalist set of skills that's applicable across multiple industries? That's where you end up writing multiple resumes for a tailored um, job description, and you still focus on the results at the end of the day. One of the things that I notice the most about resumes when I see them written is that most of these resumes tend to focus simply on the duties that one person conducted. They don't talk about the impact. They don't talk about uh, the they don't talk about the impact. They only talk about the duties that are within the job description. And that doesn't help you stand out because you look like everyone else. And the whole point of going into your job interview is to look special so that you can be different. And so that because you have those differences, you can ultimately get hired. So Self-awareness is also an important part of your job interview as well and your job search. Um, I think I, I think I think I've mentioned this already three times. So it's a really important thing to talk about, right? Knowing what it is that you want, focusing on that level of abundance in your career, knowing what skills are transferable, and creating that list of jobs that you qualify for. Um, I cannot emphasize hammering this home because the more you know this, the easier your job search will become. If you are merely firing off resumes into the ether of LinkedIn and not getting something back because you don't know what you get, you are getting exactly the results that you should be expecting, which is nothing because you are not showing that clear level of focus. If that is the one thing you take away from this webinar today, then I will have considered myself successful because you have exp you have gotten exactly to where you you have you have learned exactly what your problem has been in this job search so far. Uh, personal brand fundamentals is also is next. So knowing what you want is you know this is part two, and so you're developing, you're going on offense, you're figuring out what it is that your social media presence is, you're having a message that resonates with others, you're still creating that list of jobs to apply for, and that elevator pitch. You should be constantly introducing yourself to new people, constantly introducing yourself on your social networks and sharing what it is that you do and what it is that you're looking for. And so for all of those of you who are maybe even right now, go on your LinkedIn, 
write an introductory post. Hello, my name is so-and-so, and I'm looking for a job doing something and something. Can you share this with a friend and let me know if they may be hiring? And, you know, if you want to send that to me in the email afterwards, I'll react to it and I'll comment for reach. So then the final thing is, where do you find your jobs? So a lot of us are going to LinkedIn. We're hitting that easy apply button and we're hoping that it lands us something, which is, you know, not always the best way to go about it, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you have to find the websites that work for you, whether it's a marketing focused career site, an engineering focused career site, nonprofits, something local to your area like Albert's List can be. You're also networking. You're also going to your your career center. Even if you're still in school, you are going to your career center. Or even if you're out of school, you're going back to your career center so you can take advantage of the alumni offerings uh, that are out there, uh, even, even if you've been out of school for a while. And so with those... I'm going to transition from the fundamentals, and I'm going to go into something that's also equally as important, which is to understand what's at stake. And so as we get into the next part, this part's going to be a little bit more about job interviewing as you master those fundamental skills. And so what does it mean to talk about what's at stake, right? The stakes, as I like to say, you know, in various movie lines, are too high to ignore. A lot of us like to go into jobs thinking about what's in it for us. We're in there for the paycheck. We're in there for the experience. We're in there because maybe it's a really cool company. But we always tend to forget that a company does not open a job unless uh, there is a need for that job. And by the way, if a company could go uh, out into the world and not have anybody doing a job and just make money and have a hundred and have infinite number of profit margin, it would probably do that too. But unfortunately, jobs as we know it are not currently that way. And so as you get into the job interview, it's understanding what it is that you need to articulate in order to understand what it is that the people whom you work with uh, find important. And so this first slide here talking about what's at stake is addressing, you know, why does a job even exist in the first place? What is it in your role and what matters and what doesn't matter? And what I mean with all of these questions is to understand strategically and being a strategic business thinker, why any particular role must exist in the first place. They're not just hiring that marketing person. They're not just hiring that accountant or software engineer so they can sit there at home or sit there at their desk at work and twiddle their thumbs. They're doing it because there's a true revenue opportunity where somebody can make a difference, where somebody can uh, can add value, and ultimately, with that added value, take the company to the very next level. And so, uh, when it comes to what's at stake, there's a lot of things that are at stake when it's in consideration to this job. There's what's in the middle for you, which is always very important as it relates to uh, the money that you want, the benefits that you want, why you've taken a job at all in the first place. But then beyond that, there's also thinking about what it is that matters to all the various stakeholders that you have in the job that you're working in. And so, this is actually even beyond that too, as it goes to the company and as it goes to the industry. You might always, you might hear when you go to a particular company, uh, we're doing this for the business. We're doing this for our industry. Um, and so, you know, does this serve the business? Does this serve the industry? And all of those things matter at the end of the day, because as an individual candidate, your ability to successfully accomplish the job as somebody who's in that role is going to be important because they want to have some kind of return on investment. And so you have to think about what's at stake for your customers. Uh, if they purchase your product, how does that transform their business? How does it make them stand out within their own industry, especially if you're a service provider? If you are working with uh, your boss, what is at stake for your boss? How do you make them look really, really, really good? And by the way, that's a really good interviewing question because a lot of people go into jobs thinking that it's just for them, but it's not for the person who is above them. So how do you create clarity for your boss? How do you make them look good in their quarterly business reviews and so forth? And what do they need help with that's going to make them get to the next level of their career? 
What's at stake for your colleagues? It's often a chance that if you work in a company that's more than five to 10 people, you have collaborators whom you are working with in order to get things done. And so as somebody who has a ton of colleagues, you may want to know what helps them out as well, because that you know, gives them the feeling that they can rely on you to get to the next point in their career. It's one of those elements of you rub my back and I will rub yours. Then going to the two biggest things that are in consideration, but something that may seem very small to you is what's at stake for your company and what's at stake for the industry that you work in. And when you think about this, it's why does a company even exist today? What is the problem that it's trying to solve and how do you help your company solve that problem and get to the future? Are you helping promote something? Are you designing something? Are you counting somebody else's money so that they can be in compliance? Uh, are you helping recruit? Are you helping manage day-to-day -day people operations so that people are happy with each other? Right, And so that's how it relates to the company. And then to your overall industry, what is going on today that is so important that must occur that you can play a role in that is going to help you take that company to the next level? There's no quiet quitting here. There's no... Um, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, you know, going on TikTok and thinking that you're doing a day in the life. It's actually moving an industry forward and by by extension, almost moving the world forward so that everybody, uh, including yourself, can enjoy the value that you create to move a uh, society forward. And so how do you determine what's at stake, right? You do everything from uh, doing your research, you read up on the company, you go to their financial statements, you look at how they did their stock markets, uh, you do the 360 degree view, you look at where the company is good and where the company is bad. Um, not all companies are perfect. In fact, no company is perfect. And so um, you have to understand that it's got to be something that fits for you. You deep dive into the specifics, both in the interview and you ask the tough questions that otherwise uh, may not be asked. You asked what's at stake, you know, specifically for this particular role. Why are you hiring for this role? And what happens if somebody succeeds? What happens next? And then finally, at the very, very end of the day, you connect with what you want and you connect with what you're committed to. You have to be somebody who is, um, you have to be somebody who's interested in both of these at the end of the day, uh, because if you're not doing a very good job of that, then sometimes the company that you work for uh, may not end up being at the level that, uh, that you want and probably is some, somewhere that you shouldn't go. So with that said, now that you know what's at stake, we're going to talk a little bit about mastering the job interview because that too is a really, really important part of this entire process. And I'm going to really, really make the interview process very simple to you because I know a lot of people go into interviews, they get really nervous, uh, they, they're they not really sure what to think, they don't have their answers memorized, and they think they're almost on trial for something. And truly an interview is just two things. An interview is number one, mitigating risk for yourself as a candidate. And number two, it's selling yourself as the best solution possible. Again, as we said in the stake section, a company would not have a job role open unless it absolutely knew that it needed to hire for something. And hiring or bringing somebody in is always a risk because you are possibly changing the culture of the organization or you are changing um, changing the dynamics of how people interact or you are possibly adding even more cost, which you most definitely are because salary and benefits is a cost. And so... I generally, I like to uh, divide these two into two separate uh, buckets. Uh, mitigating risk, I like to think of is as is trying to figure out how to avoid avenues of concern. And then selling yourself as the best solution is creating avenues of excitement. If you've ever been on a date, if you've ever been in a really good job interview, an avenue of excitement is when somebody asks to learn more about what it is that's going on that you did in a project or something that you did in your life that really makes them wonder, oh, is this person a really good fit? And, you know, from there, you generally learn that you you could be because uh, there is that spot on match. It's all about matching. 
And so let's talk a little bit first about what mitigating risks look like, right? So companies are looking for red flags. And in an especially competitive market right now, where every uh, dotted I and uncrossed T and spelling error in your resume and uh, mismatch within your skills to the job description, all of those are red flags that if you give a company an easy excuse to say no, they will absolutely say no to you. And so in those competitive markets, reducing and mitigating that risk is especially important. And so you have to show up with the attitude. You have to show up with the ability to hustle and hustle in a sense of you know mindfulness. And you have to really show that you're willing to do that work. There is no room for laziness. And so once you make sure that you have dotted those I's and crossed those T's, and shown up in the best way that you can possible, it is important to know how to position yourself as the one. And so positioning yourself as the one, no, it means that you're not psyching yourself out. You're already at the interview. Companies want you to do well. And you have to showcase that you have the problem or you have the solution for all the problems that they have. You have to be able to know how to identify what's at stake, as we mentioned in the previous section. And you also have to tell the stories that set you apart from the others. And so you have to know what they're asking for, and you have to increase those avenues of excitement. And so how do you do that? Number one, you write down the stories that you know are going to be important as every part of the interview, especially if you're someone with experience. If you're somebody who's worked for 5, 10, 15 years, you have all the stories to be able to tell in those star questions or situational questions where somebody asks you about a time where you failed or succeeded and what you did next. You need to have all of those in a Word document with those answers nearly memorized so you can tell the right stories so that hiring managers know that you know your stuff. Um, in addition, you have to understand what's at stake for the business, right? So you have to ask the right questions. You have to be insightful. You have to connect the dots. You know, you have to notice that, say, maybe the company had a really fantastic quarter. And so they're hiring this role because they had that fantastic quarter. And so what ideas can you bring in to help make them uh, have an even better quarter the next time around? Because you want them, to, because their success ultimately ends up being yours. And so you have to get actionable on your, on your interviewing. You have to create and prepare those documents as we just mentioned. Get to brainstorm where you have been and where you're going because your career is a journey. And being aware of what that journey looks like is incredibly important because it showcases that you are in uh, control and understanding of where you're going. So even if you're looking for a three-month contract because it'll help tide you over into that next job, you have to take that contract for a reason. You can't just be taking jobs to take jobs, even if it's just to pay your bills for better or for worse. Number three, you have to understand what's at stake. So I've mentioned this three times already. Understanding what's at stake is important because the job search is not just about you. It's about those who you will be serving as well as the company, as well as the industry that you're going to be sitting in. Um, you have to be aware of how your stories are going to create avenues of excitement and avenues of concern. I know many of us have been laid off here over the last six months to a year. And so it's going to be easy to say, oh, well, why did you leave your last company? Um, saying something like, oh, I left because I was uh, not a good fit or I left because I was fired is going to immediately hike up those avenues of concern because it might show that you are not a good cultural fit. However, if you say something else along the lines of, well, uh, I was at this company for a while and they were concerned about their macroeconomic conditions. And so me and many others were laid off as a result because they wanted to right-size their business. And I am here today because I believe that I can take the skills that I learned at that job to help you in this new organization uh, and I can do A, B, and C is going to stand out a lot more because it shows that you are empowered. It shows that you are in control and that no matter what happens to you, you can still bring value to no matter where you go. And then finally, you can practice your answers with a friend. And I encourage you to do this 
all the time and every time if you can be. So, uh, you know, Albert's List, we have a mock interview program. It is free. We do it every single week. And we've done 87 of these since the beginning of the pandemic. And so the role of it is we bring in somebody who is a hiring manager. Uh, they do a mock interview. They give immediate feedback. And then upon that feedback concluding, uh, they, they then uh, answer and ask their next question. And as you go through this interview process, it's important that you do those as well because uh, because you need that practice. And it's much more important that you uh, make your errors here than you make them out there in the real world. So with that said, I invite all of you to reach out to me and let's set up mock interviews for the following weeks ahead. Get that practice in, get in the gym and uh, and and work at, work on those skills so that you can stand out in your interview processes. The next part that I want to talk about is skills or learning and development. This is also a very important piece. Um, it's very important that, you know, no matter what industry that you're in, that you're always constantly learning and learning new things. Um, whether it's, you know, reading the news and understanding developments, gaining those new skills, applying those knowledge to your interviews and networking regularly with professionals in the industry. And so how do you do that? Uh, when it comes to gaining that knowledge, uh, look for things that can be free for you when it comes to your job search. So as you know, uh, LinkedIn has LinkedIn Learning. Google's got a lot of free certifications. Uh, Udemy's got a lot of free stuff as well. And they can all be free if you just go down to your local library. So I know LinkedIn Learning is something like 30 bucks a month, but it's $0 a month if you get a library card. And with that library card, you also get access to movies, books, and a bunch of other things. So I encourage you to take a look at those and, uh, and, and really, you know, embrace the fact that learning doesn't have to be pricey. This webinar was free. Uh, and this webinar is free and recorded, so you'll all be able to access it later. Uh, and so LinkedIn Learning is free through your local library. You can also use YouTube. Albert's List has hours and hours of webinars going back years that you can take a look at as well. And you can apply what you learn to personal projects and take advantage of the sales that you see on Udemy as well. So, you know, Albert's List in some sense is my side project. It's something that's helped me become a better marketer. Uh, but it's also something that I also do passionately because because I believe that if we all have jobs, the whole world is a much better place because uh, we're spending our money and we're taking care of those who take care of us. So the best of the rest is really what I want to go into next. I know we're coming up here to the top of the hour. Uh, and so with 12 minutes left, um, or a little bit more than that, if you let me go a little bit beyond that, I still have 19 slides. And so we're going to go through the rest of those. And so the best of the rest is really to just look at the very top of our triangular pyramid in the hiring hierarchy. And so, uh, <laughs> my mic. Um, no, that was not free, but, uh, but it helps me sound better so I can sound clearer and all of you can hear me. And so, and so when you look at the best of the rest, uh, this is all the things that uh, you may or may not need, depending on the role that you take in the job that you end up uh, end up working in. And this involves knowing your vision, being able to work through the dynamics of a very ever-changing industry, uh, understanding the metrics and the results that you've built for the companies that you work for, uh, and then also having the right strategy and building the credibility that makes you the leader so that people can look to you as a center of excellence and a center of thought. And so what are all of these things, right? Dynamics is flexibility and really being able to weather the storm. Um, you know, unfortunately, like many of our parents or grandparents, we're no longer working at our jobs now for the next 30 years, getting that grandfather clock or that golden watch and a pension to go home to and then retire as we take cruises around the world. Unfortunately, we now live in a world where people talk about the gig economy as this hot thing and how we have to be flexible flexible and freelance for ourselves, you know, here in the next 20 years. And so your ability to be dynamic is incredibly important because uh, the ability to adjust to these business changes, capture new skills, and be continuously resilient uh, is, is incredibly key because um, 
because the world just continues to change and I don't really know how else to say it. And so your ability to communicate how you understand these dynamics as it relates to your job and also how you can communicate it to yourself as it relates to this world is going to be really important as you uh, build up your job skills and become a more attractive and interesting professional. Uh, the next piece I want to talk about is your vision, right? So, um, as you go into a company, you're not just going so that you can collect that paycheck. You're going because you genuinely see an opportunity to change the paradigms that have existed in that company, in that industry, or even for your peers. And so how do you align with the vision of your own vision to what it is that the company is providing? Can you imagine yourself leading? And what and how are you leading? And even if you're somebody who might just be an administrative assistant today or a regular marketing manager, all of these, all of the vision that you can bring to the table can help you set yourself apart because I assure you that most of the people whom you are interviewing against and competing against in the interviewing aren't thinking about vision like I'm communicating it to you today. So if you're a marketer, put together a marketing plan. If you're an administrative assistant, think about how you can improve efficiency in the office. If you're an accountant, think about how uh, you can increase efficiency, efficiency through software and communications so that your numbers can be reported on earlier. All of those visions are going to set you apart and get you to the next piece, which is metrics, which is quantifiable business impact, right? We're all going to get hired because we have quantifiable business impact to offer our companies that we want to work for. We're not just going in to get the free water, to get the free lunch. We're getting in there because we're going to help create revenue, which in turn will hopefully come back to us in the form of bonuses, successful project delivery, happy bosses, and happy customers. And so metrics can be anything that you consider to be important for how you succeed at your work. And see, these can also be known as KPIs or OKRs, also known as objectives and key results. And the more you know your metrics and the more you're able to articulate your metrics within a job interview, the higher you will go in your organization because it goes to say that not only can you show up and complete a project, you can also complete a project with some really, really, really great results. And finally, all of those things will bring you leadership, which is the ability to influence and the ability to have credibility. All 113 of you today who are attendees and all 120 people who were here earlier are leaders already. You don't need to have a fancy title. You don't need to have um, you don't need to have a fancy title. You don't need to have a lot of money coming in. You don't need to be somebody that has 20 people reporting up to them. All you need is to have the ability to influence, to have insights, to have thoughts, and to know that something that maybe you've done before has worked before, and it can work again. And so at the very top, when you're able to articulate and communicate this, then you can go anywhere and lead and be effective at it. And so now that we're getting to the end, I wanted to just put it all together. We've been talking about this hiring hierarchy here for the last 53 minutes, um, where we talk about the bottom of the, with the bottom of this pyramid, which is the hunger, the hustle, the attitude, the resilience, the commitment that you need to be effective in your job search, understanding the fundamentals of the resume, the cover letter, uh, personal branding, interviewing, networking, skills, and where to acquire those skills, right? So you're going to need a level of, um, of being resourceful. And then taking your career to the next level with your own personal vision, your metrics, your connection, and the strategy that you have. And then finally, becoming a leader in your own personal right because you know exactly what you're doing and help knowing how to help others. And so in closing, you need this comprehensive job search uh, and you need this mastery to survive a tough job market. Consistency is crucial. It's essential, if anything, I should say, because if you are not consistent and if you are not somebody who lives the hiring hierarchy back here, you're not going to find the job as quickly as you want it. And I know that's painful for many of you to hear, but it needs to happen so that you can live the life that you want to live, because I believe you should live the life that you get to live. And by, by, by bounding yourself to these habits, by bounding yourself uh, to these frameworks, 
you can help yourself even more because you have the level of discipline that those who you are competing against will not have. And so like working when you're hired, this must all be a habit. It must be something that you spend a significant amount of time on every single day so that you can get to that job. And it's understandable that you may have fears. You may be jobless for the next six months, given the way the economy is going. But you know what? If you show up every day and you put in the effort, you will get to exactly where you need to be. And so, you know, this is uh, the next few slides, which you will get because this is recorded, is, uh, you know, what you do uh, in terms of this process. So many of you might have been laid off immediately. And, you know, these are first moments that you take from a job loss. You take that deep breath. You take a few days to yourself. You review the severance package, and then you file for unemployment. Then you move into the hiring hierarchy. You build your personal brand. You start building those habits to get you into the, into the zone for your job search. You update your resume, LinkedIn portfolio, and you understand what it is that you want. And you start placing your resume on job search sites. Then you find accountability partners and support systems. Like you go on Albert's list and you try to find the people who can help you in your job search. Then you get on offense, you apply for jobs, you check your morale at the door, you get to your networking events and you get to meeting others. You practice that accountability that you got in that previous step. And then you fill up your calendars with lots and lots of interviews. And then while you're doing that, you preserve your mental health. You integrate learning into your part every day. You build a meaningful side project. You follow up because that's what every good salesperson and what every good job seeker does. And then you are prepared for just about anything. And then step five, you repeat, repeat, repeat until you get that job. And you add in elements that you may not have earlier, such as your vision, your metrics, uh, the leadership that you can provide into, um, into what it is that you do. So some closing thoughts, um, you know what, look, it's all better with a plan. Determine your level of commitment. You understand your fundamentals. You have awareness of what's at stake and you elevate yourself to the next level um, with, uh, with, with the hiring hierarchy here, because the more important it gets, the, the more, uh, the more it's important because it helps you get to that level of career freedom that you've always wanted to have. Um, and so with that, I will have a couple of things that I want to offer all of you before we leave. Number one, I want to invite you all to stay in touch with Albert's List and introduce yourself and ask for advice. Uh, we have many, many more advice posts. I see every single comment that comes through. And so please be sure to indicate that you discovered this community through this webinar. And I will be very, very happy to add you and have you contribute to our multitude of conversations. Number two, I want to help you apply this hiring hierarchy to what I like to call the Job Seeker Survival Kit. The Job Seeker Survival Kit is a, a set of 39 videos not spanning over 46 hours of content around how to job hunt, how to use elements of the hiring hierarchy, plus mock interviews that will help you get to your next level. I've valued it at $2,000 of content for just $17 today, and also for $20 a year for career office hours, where you can come in and ask me any single question that you want. And so take a picture of this slide. Uh, I don't think I can copy and paste it today, um, but I will also send it in a follow-up. And uh, and you will get this you will get this career code the the code in here so that you can uh, you can join us for these things. Um, and then if you want even more accountability, uh, we also have our upcoming eight weeks to employed job search boot camp. And so this is eight weeks of group instruction and office hours with an optional upgrade to one on one coaching with $3,000 worth of coaching starting at just $295. It's led by me, Joe Cardillo, and Elisa, who are my Albert's List co, um, co boot camp instructors. And you get access to a community of professionals and an always open LinkedIn private chat where you can talk to any of us. It, it has presentations by coaches, hiring managers, and industry leaders tailored just to you. And because I understand that job hunting is hard and that job hunting is particularly hard right now, I'm also making payment plans available. And so, uh, 
And so if you can, if, if you, if you see the $295 price tag and you realize it's too high, I am always happy to work out a payment plan with you where you put down a $50 down payment now and you pay the rest when that job search, uh, when that job search is, um, is, uh, is at a much better place. And so, um, and so uh, in, in that consideration, the boot camp it starts on February 12th, 2024. Uh, and I'll be also sending out that sign up link here in a little bit. Okay, and so with that, I invite all of you to systematize and succeed. Uh, it is a tough job market out there. It is a world where it is incredibly, um, it is incredibly competitive, but I believe with this perspective and with this framework, you too can be successful in your job search. Uh, so without further ado, I wanna thank you all for coming to spend time here. Uh, I appreciate it and I will chat with you all soon. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you in the community and in other events.